This is Florida Gulf Coast University. Thanks to movies, novels, and television shows, forensic scientists have come to be seen as some of the great criminal catching and mystery solving experts of modern time. Find out what a modern day forensic anthropologist learned from a renowned mentor, how that knowledge is being passed on to students today, and how a treasure trove of historic materials might keep that knowledge transfer in effect for generations on this edition of FGCU Perspectives. Our guest today is Heather Walsh Haney, who teaches and researches in justice studies at FGCU and is also a forensic anthropologist. Start by describing the field that you teach and research in. I am first and foremost a biological anthropologist with a subfield in forensic anthropology. So my training <laughs> is in human and non-human primate anatomy, behavior, and the cultural material that are the vestiges of our lives. So that's where you are today. Uh, did you start the education process with that in mind? My family is rich with readers, so I knew of books by laypersons, anthropologists, of course, Ruth Benedict and Margaret Mead and Marvin Harris. And I followed Marvin Harris to the University of Florida where I started taking cultural anthropology classes. Along with those classes came the basic biolog biological anthropology classes. And in that class, Bill Maples came and guest lectured. And he was an energetic, uh, parsimonious, intellectual speaker and I knew the way that he presented the field of forensic anthropology that I wouldn't be stuck in an academic ivory castle. I'd be able to do real world work where my, my answers could literally walk into a courtroom and tell me whether I was right or wrong. And as has that field, that, that uh, biological anthropology, uh, especially as it relates to criminal justice work, has that been taught for long? No, it really hasn't. And in fact, when I was a student of Dr. Maples's, he didn't have lecture classes in forensic anthropology. He only selected a few students every year that he would literally pour his knowledge into. And that was because he didn't want bad guys knowing how we specialists catch them. And so today when I teach forensic anthropology to my graduate students, I teach them the secrets that I don't necessarily teach to undergrads. And undergrads uh, classes, I'm really giving them a holistic view, and I'm always going back to how we go about proving and disproving hypotheses, and how in general it affects the human condition. Uh, I have an architect friend, another A, uh, art and, and study, um, who likes to corner people and say, name three famous architects. Mm -hmm. And most people can get one, and then they'll struggle with maybe, you know, Mike Brady from the Brady Bunch. Right. I would be hard pressed to come up with the names of three famous anthropologists. I'd give you Margaret Mead, but then I'd, I'd stop. Is that changing? Absolutely. We have Kathy Reichs, who has written 13 or 14 fiction novels, and the TV show Bones is modeled after her character. Uh, and then we have Bill Bass, who started the Anthropological Research Facility, or what Patricia Cornwell calls the body farm. Body farm. Right. And then we have Clyde Snow. Uh, Clyde Snow is world renowned in helping in the identification of genocide victims and human rights victims in general. So the, the premise that we started with, that uh, novels and television shows and movies, uh, it is a case of art imitating life, not, not uh, vice versa. Absolutely. The, the studies are there, the work is being done. Yes. And it's becoming pervasive. Uh, now when I'm on a crime scene, law enforcement knows or expects that a forensic anthropologist will be there if this is someone who is decomposing or skeletonized. I've been in this field now 16 years. And in the beginning when I would deal with law enforcement in particular, they didn't really know what an anthropologist was. And on occasion, I'd even be referred to as the pathologist. And I'm not a medical doctor, right? I'm a PhD. We hear bones, of course, being brought up a lot in the kind of work you do. Is it always bones? No, the work that I do is not always skeletal remains. In southern and subtropical climates like we have here in Florida, most of my cases are skeletal, but I'm often called in to help with fresh cases where I'm helping to analyze 
uh, evidence of trauma, do tool mark comparisons, look at stab wounds, for example, that might be on a rib or on a vertebra and left unseen by a pathologist, but with the anthropologist, not only can we locate it, but we can also hopefully tell you whether it was a serrated blade or not, or a type of saw, whether it was hand-powered or gas-powered that did a dismemberment. So going, going back to, to William Maples, um, having an opportunity to uh, learn from, study with, tell me about that. I cherish the time that I had with Dr. Maples, and he, into my um, work with him, he developed a glioblastoma, brain cancer, which is inevitably fatal. And he lived a year with that cancer. And in that time, I had an opportunity, for example, to go to Bosnia and help out in human rights cases. But rather than do that, I wanted to stay with my mentor. And he was at the lab and teaching his students as much as possible because he wanted to make sure that he could pour his knowledge into us. What was his career? What was his background and what drew you to him? Ah, he, he started as a um, ambulance driver and then uh, during his studies at the University of Texas, he uh, worked with Ellis Curley where he went off to Africa. And in Africa, he was working with non-human primates, cataloging them and trying to understand genetic differences between different primates. And then from there, uh, he went up to a smaller university in the Northeast and then went on to University of Florida. And while he was there at the University of Florida, he looked at the remains of the, the last Tsar of Russia, the Romanovs. He was called in to evaluate the remains of Joseph Merrick, otherwise known as the Elephant Man. He was contacted to evaluate the skeletal remains of President Zachary Taylor. He was contacted by the Evers family to help in the analysis of Medgar Evers. The list goes on and on and on. He was known as a meticulous scientist and someone who expected the best out of everyone. When he was called in to consult on these cases or to do research on these cases, what was it that he was doing? What was he bringing that had not been, uh, had not been done in, in those instances? Well, especially with the Romanovs, um, with their remains, he brought the entire armory with him. He could do meticulous macroscopic photography. He could do histology, the cellular analysis of bone. He could quickly read a skeleton, determine who that person was and how they died, much faster than other scientists. He could work alone, but he was also very capable of looking at colleagues and friends and figuring out who is best suited to help me answer this question. So his efficiency and his meticulousness really helped him shine above others. And people like you come out of his teachings and continue to do high profile things. Yes, yes. I am blessed uh, to be at Florida Gulf Coast University. In fact, this is the place where Dr. Maples wanted to retire. His first case came out of Port Charlotte, mm. his first forensic anthropology case. And when I was looking at universities, uh, I, his widow, Margaret Maples, had really stood behind me when I focused like a laser on FGCU and mentioned that this would be a university where we could build a program around for, uh, the teaching of Bill Maples and how I would take the field into the next generation. What role, as you talk about the next generation, um, what role does technology play? Oh, it's huge. The field is always changing. We cannot stay uh, static. Uh, also because the, the criminals get smarter and better. So we have to be able to you know, change our, our field of focus you know, or depth of field, so to speak, mm -hmm. where we use digitizers now to help in the metric analysis of skeletal remains, where we'll measure cord lengths of crania or long bones to figure out how tall someone was, what their sex was. Uh, we'll use histology to grind pieces of bone and look for evidence of healing or or trauma that happened around the time of death. So, so much, so much has changed and I'm able to bring that on to my students. And the, the knowledge of these things might have existed uh, prior, but an ability to measure it might not have. Well said, absolutely. The ability to change again the scale, to have a more focused analysis. The tools are easier to obtain now, they're less expensive, and it's something that translates very easily to 
my undergraduate forensic anthropology class, when they're learning how to read a microscope and look at the cellular development of bone, it takes away the scariness of technology and it opens them up to other fields of science. So to brag for a moment, and you get, you get just, just a moment to do that, high profile things, things that you might have worked on that uh, we might have heard of the, uh, the situations. Well, uh, as part of the uh, federal government's DMORT team, I responded to the World Trade Center. So I helped, uh, I worked at the Staten Island landfill there to help in the identification of biological material. I helped in uh, Hurricane Katrina, also with DMORT, where I helped in the analysis of, uh, and recovery of human remains there. I have helped in the analysis of the eight young men that were found in Fort Myers. Mm and uh, believed to have been killed by a serial killer. So I helped in the analysis of those skeletal remains. Boy, I've worked in Bermuda, Fiji, Guatemala, uh, Bahamas. I work with nine medical examiner districts in Florida, and right now I'm, I'm doing you know, quite a few cases. To me, every case is high profile because I wanna find the answers and I wanna help families. Dealing with a lot of tragedy and unfortunate circumstances then. Yes, and when I'm dealing with undergraduates who are thinking about continuing with graduate school or I'm working and mentoring with my, my hand-picked graduate students, that's one of the things that we have to talk about is sort of debriefing because we deal with infants who have been brutalized by parents. We deal with women who have been torn apart by spouses or boyfriends. And those are images that can stay with you, but through mentoring and th allowing my students to really talk about their feelings, uh, all of us are pretty sound emotionally. You know, we're, we're cut from a different cloth, people who want to deal with the dead. And it, it's, it's a special type of person. And we're not macabre. Uh, we are really trying to help those who can't speak for themselves. Are there some, is there some work that you've done that is more satisfying than others? I tell you, the work that has been most, most satisfying as of late is to see the growth of my graduate students. Mm -hmm. I have one graduate student in particular who received a very large um, PhD fellowship to be part of the CUNY system. And she is in an evolutionary primatology program that wherein she beat out students from Harvard and Stanford and you know top echelons of universities, and it's from the program here at FGCU. She's brilliant in and of her own right, but her ability to publish, her ability to work in scientific settings and work closely with a mentor who focused upon her students and not just my own research and my own books allowed her to continue on in Dr. Maples' legacy. So you've had a great mentor. You're becoming or are one. Where do your students, in addition to, to that example, what, what, what will they become? What will they go on and do? I have another student who is a, a civilian scientist for the Air Force. He beat out well-seasoned military investigators uh, for the position. It was highly coveted. He beat out hundreds, literally hundreds, of um, folks who ha already had degrees in hand and had worked in the military. I have students who are medical legal death investigators. I have students, for the most part though, who are focused on getting an, a PhD and teaching and consulting uh, as a forensic anthropologist. But it's really my hope, as it was Dr. Maples' in his book, Dead Men Do Tell Tales, in the last few pages. He says that it was his hope that every medical examiner office in Florida and throughout the United States would have a forensic anthropologist on staff. And that's my dream. I don't want to have to consult for 10 medical examiner districts my whole life here in Florida. I'd like to know that my students are part of those systems and that they can call on me in a particularly difficult case, but that they're really part from the system as soon as the case appears. It's easy to take a look at those, uh, I asked you to brag, and, and to take a look at the, the high profile, the things that show up in the news. What's a mundane uh, activity for a uh, a forensic anthropologist? What's, what's a what's a day-to-day -day encounter? A mundane activity is when uh, someone in jail decides that he or she wants to get out of jail free card for the day and happens to remember about a homicide and where a body was hidden by a friend of a friend of a friend. And with law enforcement and sometimes the FBI, my students and I end up going out to citrus groves, for example, and methodically searching for the burial site, going over aerial photographs, looking at changes in soil cover, and then only to find that there's nothing there. And that's 
that's the, the more mundane side, the frustrating side. You, you've mentioned uh, Dr. Maples several times. Um, uh, not only does his uh, mentoring bring, you know, help you become who you are and bring you to this university, but it brings that relationship, brings something else to the university. Tell us, tell us about that. It does. So when I came to FGCU, uh, Margaret Maples, his widow, uh, worked with me to bring the William R. Maples collection to FGCU. And this collection it consists of the non-human primates that he collected in Africa. So we have everything from tiny little marmosets to chimpanzees. Uh, which is rare to have access to skeletal material like that. In addition, we have all of his notes, his data, his slides, his photographs from all of those historic cases. Everything from Medgar Evers to the Romanovs to President Zachary Taylor, and our hope is that all this material will be digitized, and then as international and national researchers want to access it, they'll be able to, and all through FGCU. What does that bring to a student's education, having a, a, an archive like that? It allows them to see real life evidence of what forensic anthropology can do. It also allows them to see the similarities and differences between non-human primates and humans. And it also- why, why is that important? It's important because the manifestation of our anatomy, of having these large brains and walking on two feet, uh, seeing humans and how we behave and how we move is through an evolutionary perspective. So it helps us tease apart what makes us human, but it also makes us more respectful of the animal world around us. You, I interrupted you. You were, you were listing the many ways that it might benefit a student that have this archive of material. Well, it's a springboard for them to continue on in research. For example, in looking at Dr. Maples' notes for the elephant man, uh, it was originally thought that he had myositis ossificans, which is a disease process that causes calcification of uh, soft tissues, okay. and that would cause his deformity. But perhaps the students would want to continue on and come up with differential diagnoses to try to figure out where has science taken us today that might allow us to look at alternative uh, diseases that may have caused Joseph Merrick's horrible condition? There's not a week that goes by that we don't read something in the news about somebody going through some archive and finding some new... Oh, yes. ...something new about something that exists in an archive. Can that happen here? Oh, absolutely. The photos that we have of the Romanov family, for example, the skeletal remains, if someone were to go through that archive and look at those remains, they would probably be, the photos rather, of those remains, they'd probably be able to tease apart it, the types of trauma that was inflicted and where it was, maybe even understand the sequence of blows in one of the individuals. And again, with technology advancements, not only what we have today, but what we have five years from now, 10 years from now, 15 years from now, they might be able to see something that you couldn't see today. Absolutely, with fresh eyes. Fresh eyes are so important in any case. In fact, my students and I work on cold cases all the time for various medical examiner districts in Florida. Some of these cases are from the 70s, 80s, 90s, and fresh eyes, especially from an anthropological point of view, can really help turn the case in a new direction, help to put the bad guys and gals in jail, and help to identify someone who was previously unidentified. Um, the materials that you talk about in, in Dr. Maple's uh, treasure trove, mm -hmm, I said. Mm -hmm. um, suitcase full, file cabinet full, how, how big a? Oh no, bookshelf full. Okay. <laughs> there are thousands upon thousands of uh, parts of the archive. And that's not even teasing apart the skeletal material. Every skeleton can have upwards of 206 bones in them. So for those non-human primates, I mean, it, it's priceless. Um, a phrase that comes up in, uh, in materials about you, uh, reading the bones. Yes. Tell me about reading the bones. So it is my job to have a focused analysis of skeletal remains. And so I'll look at the upper arm bone or humerus and I'll, I'll read it, I'll look at it, I'll study it to see is this the humerus of a male or female? Was this somebody who was active? Was this the, the insertion of a muscle that might indicate this person was a baseball player or a welder? That's what I mean by reading bones. And the opportunity comes up frequently. Oh, daily. Daily I have 
new cases. Daily I am working on finishing the case that came before it. And daily my students are with me. Right now as I sit here talking with you, my, there are five graduate students in the morgue in the Collier County Medical Examiner's Office and they are working with the skeletal remains there under the supervision of a pathologist. So many fields, uh, uh, research is done and, and, and a benefit goes to, to many. A lot of what you do, the benefit goes to a family, the benefit goes to um, you know, a, a legal system. Um, how does that spread? Is there, is there a way of kind of compounding uh, the effect of, of, of work that's done in your field? Well, absolutely. I've spent a great deal of time working with Victoria Sanford, who is a cultural anthropologist in Guatemala City, Guatemala. And so one of the things that I've done there, and I've brought graduate students with me, is that we've looked at current cases that are evidence of femi feminicide, which is the murder of women that mm. is sanctioned by the government. And so we go in and we analyze the skeletal material so we can make stronger and stronger cases against a government that doesn't care about its women. We talked about um, the movies and the uh, novels and television shows. What do they get right and what do they get wrong? Oh, it's amazing how much they get right. In fact, I have to put my cards out on the table and tell you that I consult for The Bones Show and for CSI. Uh, in the writers that I've spoken to really strive to you know, get to the nuts and bolts of the analysis. But obviously it's art. And so there, uh, there is bits of technology that doesn't occur in real life. Or if it did, uh, fledgling uh, anthropologists like me wouldn't have access to it. But I, my students also have a project where they analyze the Bones show. They pick out a series, mm. uh, one section of the series, and they will tease it apart, whether it's determining the sex of the skeleton or the age of an individual. And then they'll go back to journal articles and figure out where the science has changed since that show aired, since the writers highlighted a particular type of science in the show. And then they present their findings to the class. And I bet they always have the best technology. Those, yes, those of shows. course they do. <laughs> uh, deep pockets. <laughs> so on, on, on shows like that and, and, and as they uh, increase in frequency and in popularity, does that drive more people to your field or, an, or to have an interest in the field anyway? It does. Uh, there are, I definitely get students now who um, maybe they're visiting campus as part of our opening to bring in high school students to have them think about FGCU. And I'll have high school students talk to me. And they'll say, oh, I watch Bones, I watch CSI, this is what I want to do. So it absolutely has an effect. In fact, I've been part of a course that brings forensic science to grade school teachers so that they can help to really grab students and get them interested and unafraid of science. And absolutely the shows, the fiction novels, the, I also noticed the bringing females and young women into the math and science fields, which is, is wonderful to see. So you get, a, 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 I don't want to say renewed attention, but a heightened uh, attention for, for a program as a result of, of these fictional encounters. Do you have to dissuade any? If you get this group of people that comes in, I, I want to do exactly that. Yes. Do you have to say, well, it's not I exactly do. that? I, 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 I don't want to say I dissuade, but I will definitely remove the rose-colored glasses in that I am first and foremost a scientist. So I spend a lot of time by myself. I spend a lot of time reading. I spend a lot of time surrounded by bones. And it is tiring, meticulous work. And I want to make sure that the students understand that, that they have to have a love of research first and of writing because all of our work has to culminate in writing and hopefully publication. The other thing that I have to make sure that they understand is I don't just work with skeletonized remains, that I work with fresh remains. And some forensic anthropologists also work with the living. In fact, I've had one case where I was evaluating the, the age of a refugee based upon radiographs or x-rays of his bones. So you know, I need my students to understand that we deal with the living, we deal with the dead, and that the dead can be in various stages of freshness and decomposition. So you, you've brought us to the present that you know, dealing with the living, but you deal a great deal with the past. Yes. What's the future? What's the future for forensic anthropologists and, and the, the people who are coming out of your program, the people who will be coming into and then coming out of your program? The future for my students is one that will hopefully include a PhD, 
where they'll be teaching students the field. They'll be consulting as forensic anthropologists, but they can also be part of museum systems where they're curators. I've had um, some of my mentors worked with plastic surgeons uh, because we're so used to looking at skeletal facial structures that they've been there at surgery uh, and can tease apart suture morphology or the joints of the head to help a plastic surgeon and dealing with cleft lip and cleft palate. Um, my students can work with law enforcement agencies. It's a, almost a direct conduit to the FBI uh, working in evidence collection teams. But ideally, I want my students to do what my mentor instilled in me, and that is to be a scholar practitioner. I want them to go on and to you know, teach as a professor and to practice the field. And, and as, a, as a teacher, what, 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 do the, what do they teach? Ah, well, they'll teach things like um, gross anatomy in medical schools. They will teach human osteology, the scientific study of bone. They can teach introduction to anthropology, physical anthropology, biology, chemistry, you name it. It is a hard science. I want to thank you for taking the time to be with us today. It's, a, it's an exciting field, and it's, it's interesting to hear how it relates to its fictional counterparts. Thank you very much. Thanks for your time. <laughs>